friends, residents, it's a great honor to speak here to you today at this rally. I grew up in Bukit Panjang town and have always lived here since, in this area since. Where I used to live when I was very young is now redeveloped and is where Senja Estate is. In the past, they call it the Zaiko, 11 mouth. Now it's a beautiful estate, the Senja Precinct. I studied at Bukit Panjang English School, now known as prim the Bukit Panjang Primary School. And I live about one kilometer away, so I walk to school every, every day, uh, even though it's a one kilometer. And that has trained me up very nicely to do all the house visit here for, for the last, how many times? 120 blocks across our estates over many times. Thank you. My family still lives close by. My wife shops around here at Bangkit, at Fajar. My children, when they are ill, when they are sick, they will come to a clinic nearby. I will have many of my meals here at Bukit Pajang Town. So this is my home. This is where my life is. There's a strong sense of ownership to this place. And I want this place to continue to improve, continue to progress. I want to keep improving the life of our residents here and I'm not about to let someone who have the faintest idea of what the issue here in this town is all about to turn back the progress that we have made. This is my home, this is where I belong to. <laughs> Having lived here in the, for the most part of my life, I know firsthand what are the challenges in our estates. I know the ins and outs I'm familiar with every corner of this town, and I have the institutional memory of this place. Bukit Jamanjang Town was created in the 80s to resettle residents from areas such as Chochukang, Lim Chu Kang, and Woodlands. Therefore, the town was actually built in phases to resettle residents, and starting from this stretch, the Pitya area, the, the Gangsa, and the Pending area, about 20, 30 years ago. So there are old flats here, there are also new flats here, they are as new as only a few months old at Senja and Sega. So facilities were being built in phases, for example, public transport. And I know that, that very well that public transport has been an issue for our residents here. I rem remember not too long ago, some roads in this town, like Jalapan Road or Sega Road, do not even have buses running through here. It was only served by the LRTs. So that is why we push very hard for additional buses here, and I'm very pleased that we have produced results here. Just in the last two years alone, 68 buses were being added on to improve 17 services in our town. Last two years alone, and there are, uh, before that there were more, but I, can't, I don't have the numbers now because it's keep adding on, but just last two years alone, there are 68 buses. Residents can now take bus service 972 at almost at their doorstep and can reach Orchard Road in 20 minutes on a, on a smooth day. I remember in June 2011, that was after last election, June 11, I invited Transport Minister Lita Il to take an LRT ride with me during the morning peak hours just to show him that our LRTs are really crowded. He came, but we forgot that the June period was the school holidays. So it was not as crowded as it should be. So I told him, I say, this is not counted. I'll, can I invite you again? Without hesitation, he said, let me come back again in July. And he did. So we took a ride and he saw for himself the crowded LRT. And thereafter, he announced a major upgrading program for our LRT system, the Bukit Panjang LRT system the LTA will procure 13 more train cars to add to the 19 train cars that's cu currently running, representing a 50, more than 50% increase in the capacity. And he also announced that there will be a new platform in our Chochukang station for the LRT so that commuters can come out of the LRT smoother and then you can you know, spread the crowd a bit. 
So I'm very, happy, I'm very grateful for him that he made a really a direct intervention to say there's a problem with this system, we need to upgrade. And I'm very happy that we are seeing the results now and there are more trains being added on in the next few months. One of my earliest speeches in Parliament in 2007 was to push for the early construction of the downtown line MRT. And I'm very pleased that the government has agreed to go ahead to build sooner than later, so to build the, the, the downtown line sooner. And come 27 December this year, our residents here will have not one, not two, but three modes of transport to serve our residents. We will have our additional buses to come to be servicing us, the enhanced bus services. We will have the upgraded LRT system, and then we will have our Bukit Panjang downtown line MRT station ready and the downtown line ready to run 27 December this year. This will be a game changer because it's going to improve our connectivity, it's going to be better serve our residents and there will be more easy, more convenient, less crowded trains and, and buses and LRTs and it's going to be much better for residents and we will largely solve our transport problem here. This and the many other concrete efforts that we put in place to improve our lives of residents involve a lot of hard work to negotiate with the agencies, with the operators, require a strong case or justification to be put up. So here is where MP on the ground, prepared to work hard, who are prepared to work very hard, persistent and able to justify a case can make a difference, of course. And of course, for us, you know, for MPs from the PAP, we do have direct access to our ministers and we make sure that they listen to us. For me, I will just bite and not let go. I make sure they listen to me and listen to my justification and give me the help that I need. <laughs> Divian Tamam is here. He is one of the our minister, our deputy prime minister that I also bug him quite a lot. I remember I have to put forward to him a case where we need to have a third access to our Bukit Panjang MRT station. We have a station, there were two exit and access to the station. I say, how can it be only two? Because we have another area of Senja residents who will be coming in from the other side. But the plan only have two. So I say, no, we, we should have another one. And I put up a strong case to LTA, to the ministry, and eventually I have to lobby Nibian Taman and say, can MOF fund this so that we can have another access for residents. I'm glad that he agree, and now we are building the third access for our MRT station just to make sure that <laughs> residents will have sheltered underground access to our train station. <laughs> Having lived here for so many years, I never dreamed that our town, our estates will be disconnected, will be so connected here now. And I look forward to joining our residents come December 27 to take the downtown MRT to work. I will see you there at the MRT station. Over the years, I walked around the estates, I've been visiting your homes, and one of, the, one of the concerns that is raised to me often is about cost of living. I want to talk a little bit on that today. Cost of living is a concern to me as well. Coming from a humble family, when I was young, I know what is it like to count every dollar, to count every cent in your pocket. I remember in the years when I was studying the polytechnic and my family having to go through financial difficulties, I have to watch every dollar I spend. If I can, don't, I can cut short a meal, I will do that. And I have to give tuition to supplement the family income. So cost of li living, I can feel it. I know how is it like. I know the residents is also feeling the effects. The key is, what are we going to do about it? By just shouting on top of our voice that cost of living is a problem, very high, like what our opponents do, doesn't solve the problem. Cost of living will not come down as a result of being, people being critical, but without coming up with any workable solutions. So what's the PAP doing about it? What's the government doing about it to reduce the cost of living? As a backbench MP, I will always scrutinize the government policies and actions 
to look out for areas that will impact cost of living and to push a policy that will minimize the impact of cost of living. I think this is something that many MPs do, the PAP MPs do, we will always challenge the minister to say, does it impact the cost of living? So what has the government done and those things that have supported and pushed? Firstly, we must make sure that we continue to have a vibrant and lively economy that create jobs, that create jobs that the salary will continue to increase. At the end of the day, if salaries, our, our wages can go up, then household will be in a better position to cope with the higher cost of living, should it come. So economic growth is important, and we need to keep having good job opportunities for the young, for the seniors. And then having economic growth will allow us, give us resources, general resources for us to help more Singaporeans by way of more subsidies and grants to, so that you know, we can help mitigate the cost of living. Having higher wages also allow our household to cope with not just the cost of living, but also the increasing cost of better lifestyle needs. We don't just want to deal with basic necessity. We want to make sure that every Singaporean can spend on lifestyle as well. If you want to buy a nice handphone, you want to buy a good computer, a nice big screen TV, we want, we want to make sure that the economy can generate the income, the increasing income that our, res our citizens can, can afford that. I think that's most important. We don't just want to take care of basic necessity, but we want to make sure that you can continue to afford things in life that you can enjoy, you know, you like. So there's no doubt that we need to continue to grow the economy. It, it have, there's no other way out for us as a small island state. Our country, our viability, our survivability depends on Singapore being able to continue to product, produce goods and services that the world consumer will buy. I think it's, it's the, that's the only way we can sustain ourselves as a country. So we need to grow the economy to, so that we have the higher income to be able to cope with the cost of living. Secondly, Singapore is an island state. We have a very small land mass. We import almost everything that we consume. That will never change. We are trading nations. We trade our services and goods for foreign exchange to pay for our imports. To pay to, that will, that will, for our needs. So the value of the Singapore dollar is very important to us. A weaker Sing dollar means that when we pay, we buy for buy, pay for our Samsung Note 5 from Korea, it will cost us more because our Sing dollar is weak. If, if our Sing dollar is weak, it will just cost us more. Weaker Sing dollar will also mean that when we travel overseas, you know, whether it's to Taiwan or to Australia and so on, it will cost us more as well. So it's very important that we have to keep our currency strong so that we can mitigate the important inflation. And of course, for many of our residents here, we do, go, they, we do go to Malaysia from time to time to shop and to buy, to eat. And we know now with ringgit, sing dollar to three ringgit is a joy to many of us. You know, we, we are a strong currency. We can buy the same thing with lesser sing dollars. When Singapore was kicked out of Malaysia in 1965, the sing dollar to ringgit was one. One sing dollar, one ringgit. That was in 1965. Today, as we celebrate Singapore's 50th years of independence, one sing dollar can buy three ringgit. <laughs> Singapore bully, right? So the crazy ideas, the crazy economy ideas of the STP, whatever they, they come up with, those research theses they come up with, will reverse all this. And believe me, I have worked in the financial markets for the last 20 years. I've seen how currency got devalued into a fraction in days, in weeks. The, the rupiahs, the ringgits, the Thai baht during the financial crisis. It can just disappear. The value can just disappear overnight if we have the wrong fundamentals, we have, if we have got our policy wrong, and if the markets lose confidence in you. So the reason why Singapore is able to have a sing dollar, strong sing dollar is because we have a strong economy, strong fundamentals. The international markets are confident, 
confident about Singapore. Our international ratings, very strong at triple A. Very few countries have that. And we have strong reserve and strong balance sheet. And then importantly, how people look at us is they look at a country with stable political, uh, political stabilities. And that means a lot to investors, to how people see the value of Sing dollars. So firstly, economy. Secondly, you need a sing, strong Sing dollar to help mitigate the cost of living. Thirdly, I think the government will always have to come up with measures, assistance, subsidies and grants to help reduce the cost of living and to improve affordability. Healthcare subsidies, education subsidies, childcare subsidies, housing grants, social assistance, those assistance to the special needs and so on, they must be there because we need to help our citizens to be able to cope with the cost of living. And over the years, under DBM Taman as a finance minister, we have seen that spending increase over the years. Healthcare, social assistance and so on, they have all increased, housing grants as well. So that are uh, what we do, you know, the practical things that we do to cope with the cost of living. But we have to, again, come back to this point that we have to continue to grow our economy so that, you know, we are able to generate the resource to cope with the cost of, to, to pay for all these subsidies, to pay for all these grants, to pay for all these assistance packages. The SDP called for a minimum wage system. Personally, I have no issue with minimum wage. But the question is whether does it solve the problem? Wouldn't the workfare system where the government supplement the income of low wage worker is a better system? Isn't that a better system where, you know, when you're low wage, the government will come in to give you some uplift on your wages? Many countries have implemented minimum wage. It has done very little to improve the lives of low income workers. For example, some employers where they have minimum wage. There are cases where they are not prepared to increase the salary of the workers. They just pay the minimum wage, that's all. So what happens is minimum wage becomes maximum wage. Is that what we want? A better approach would be to have a progressive wage system where income will, will rise together with skill upgrades, with job redesign and so on. I think we want the wages to go up because like I say we don't just want to pay for basic necessity. We want Singaporeans to be able to pay for other lifestyle items that they want in their lives, to enjoy life as well with the families. I heard on radio a few days ago that STP not only want to have minimum wage, but they want to have minimum wage for foreign, foreign workers as well. Foreigners as well, they want to pay minimum wage to foreigners. I'm a bit confused. On one hand, they have been scolding us to say that the government has been having this influx of foreign workers into Singapore. And on the other hand, you're telling, you say that I'm going to have a policy where I pay our foreigners, foreign workers minimum wage. Do they know the implication of this? Do they know the implication to the companies? If companies who, for example, have cleaners from maybe say Bangladesh or any other countries, who are prepared to work lesser, but you say, no, I want to pay you higher, I want to pay 1,002 plus. That's the number I think they quoted. How will the company cope? If they can't absorb that cost, wage cost increase, what will they do? They pass on to the consumers, and they will push up the cost of living, because at the end of the day, somebody got to foot the bill. So this is the kind of thinking they have for STP opponents. You know, they just say, let's have one very fashionable minimum wage, pay everybody, including foreign workers. Is that what we want to do? And, you know, when you say pay all foreign workers, you will say that will include the foreign domestic worker as well. Or in some terms, people call it our mates, although that's not the correct word. But, you know, we are prepared to pay our foreign domestic worker even the minimum wage. What would that mean to our household? That will clearly eat into your disp our disposable income. Is that what they want to do? Have they thought through carefully what they're saying? So I say, let's be careful about all, all these changes in policy, these fashionable ideas that you come up with. Does it work for us? So besides the national approach, I think at our town level, our GRC level, 
you know, we do work on a lot, we do have local initiatives that will help to, help to lower the cost of living here. For example, you know, for Bukit Panjang Town, you know that we're going to have two hawker centres coming, right? I mean, you're going to have not one, but two hawker centres. One at Bangkit, one at Senja. We want to have more competition so that food prices will not go up. We want to have, you know, more choices for residents here so that when they want to go for a meal, there are many choices there and there are competition that will keep the prices up. I think that's the practical way of keeping cost of living down rather than to come up with fanciful ideas you know, that would not work. We are going to have us talk to HGB to have more spaces, to have coffee shops, provision shops, so that there's competitions again you know, to keep the prices down here. We have managed to convince the MOH to set up a polyclinic here. Do you know where is it? Yes. Bukit Panjang Town will have our own polyclinic. We don't have to go to Teck Whye at Chochu Gang now. There will be a polyclinic for our own. And that is so that we can have afford affordable health care and at the conv convenience for our residents here. We are also going to build more childcare centres. We are going to invite more anchor operators, those operators that provide affordable childcare uh, fees so that our families, our young families in our estates they will have more child care places available. We have already added on uh, quite many child care centers. There were six being opened in the last, just last one over year, and we intend to increase some more. There are more places coming, including one that's 200 places at the Helium. So these are the practical things that we're doing to help mitigate cost of living to our residents here, to our residents in our estate and our GRC. So if you look at our GRC manifesto, these are all laid out there how we intend to help our residents to live a good life here, to build a strong home here for you to raise your children and to take care of seniors. You know, this is what we are going to do in practical, in, in, in fact, I mean, there is practical help of our, for our residents. So please, when you receive the Rejasi Manso, do, do it through carefully, don't just throw it away, keep it there, check, make sure that five years down the road, we have done all that we have promised you. Keep it, keep it with you. Let me just say a few words in Mandarin before I wrap up in English. 各位精英朋友,大家晚上好。改善你们的生活是我的动力你知道我是一个埋头苦干的一个议员我会用汗水为你们服务他说你是不是受人多委屈
有冲劲的一个队员团队，我们会把我们的居民的生活改善得更好，肯定一年比一年好。谢谢大家。Let me finally just say this, uh, just final few words. I'm naturally not a good speaker. I think some of you will know, you know. Uh, I'm not good with big words or mother flowery motherhood statements. Uh, just to admit, my English is uh, not good enough to get to the JC. But I'm very proud that I'm able, till today I'm very proud that I'm able to enter the polytechnic and do a diploma course in the poly. My poly life is the best three years of my life. I study very hard. I have a very active life there, a uh, student life in poly. And my poly education has shaped me to be a very down-to-earth person, very pragmatic, and inst instill in me this can-do spirit and never say die. In 2006, when I was introduced as a candidate, the Prime Minister introduced me as a poly comeback kid. And I felt very proud about it because it shows that in the Singapore system, we do have opportunity for our people who can make a comeback and to have social mobility. I think that's important. We must give people a chance and to make a comeback. <laughs> Singapore has overcome all odds in the last 50 years for a generation like myself to be able to provide for my families, to have a comfortable home, to have a safe and secure environment. I think the last 50 years has provided our generation this. Our system today now encourage multiple pathways, varied opportunities for all our young, for our young, and there's even more conducive environment to make comebacks, to pursue your dreams, to pursue your aspiration. It has changed, yes. Now, there are more opportunities out there. Even if you choose a path and you want to switch course, there are also opportunities for you there. And this is our system now, and let's all work together to uphold this. Fear not, believe me, we are now in a better position now as a country to offer better future for ourselves and for our children, to take care of our seniors, and Singapore is a city of hope. So let's work together, we are in this together, with you, for you, for Singapore! Thank you!